just to summarise, Jack came to Western Australia about 1964-65 on a project and uh, from Texas where he was as a soil conservation or I think what we'd commonly call uh, here in Australia an agricultural scientist and on a project and uh, which took him to the uh, West Kimberley and the Fitzroy River. Jack recognised the potential of that particular area when comparing it with similar areas in Texas and uh, that's where the story starts and away we go. He spent 20 plus years of his life living on the Fitzroy River and uh, during that time encountered all sorts of uh, impediments and obstacles which I'm sure he'll tell you about but he uh, typically came to Western Australia with a can-do attitude and set about doing it. Jack will tell you about his uh, activities in the West Kimberley and the realising of his dream with regard to that particular area. He wrote a book, To Damn or Be Damned, and uh, if you haven't read it, I'd suggest you do. It's a great story and it fills in a lot of gaps in the history uh, of that era from the 60s up until today. I've been reading the paper in the last few days and seeing the Chinese doing all sorts of things in the north and everything. I think, well, Jack was probably on the right track. He came to Western Australia as a Texan and stayed. Spent 20 odd years of his life living up there under all sorts of uh, conditions and now his daughter is here today with us. Uh, his grandchildren live in Western Australia. Jack is now an Australian citizen or is an Australian citizen and uh, his, well his grandchildren, eight I think, are all Australian citizens of wealth living in Western Australia. So I'd like you to welcome Jack to uh, talk to us about his life in the West Kimberley. Thank you. Well, thank you Roger. Uh, I'm amazed to see a bunch of you people who I have, some of you I haven't seen in years. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm particularly honoured to have my daughter here, Ariane Prevo. Stand up, Ari, huh? <laughs> that little girl, uh, when she was at St. Hilda's, we used to have to threaten her to make her go to bed and quit studying. She was the most studious gal you've ever, ever met. And, uh, when she graduated from the University of West Australia, they gave three awards in the School of Architecture. And uh, Ariana won all three of them. <laughs> and uh, in fact, the, she took me over and introduced me to the president of the university. And, and he told me, he said, you know, she's one of the most outstanding students we've ever had. And he said, uh, you being her father, he said, what do you attribute it to? I said, well, she's a chip off the old block. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, anyway, uh, I'd like to start off my experience in West Australia. You know, our mining wealth coupled with our being able to desail water from the Indian Ocean has lulled us into complacency. We live in a time of self-gratification. Earth is the fastest growing city in our nation. It'll have a, in 2050, by the time, uh, and, and that will be, I enjoyed my 47th year in West Australia last month. Uh, by the time 47 more years go by, we'll have a population of Perth of four and a quarter million people. 
Our children's grandchildren will be faced with feeding a world of nine billion. The UN forecasts that we will see wars over water and over world hunger. All this while, we take our wealth, we build bell towers, we build a billion dollar, we're going to build a billion dollar football field and other projects for the city dweller. There's no boats out there in the bush, so up the hill. In Texas, we have just a bunch of tall poppies. And because of their industry and their know-how, we have billion dollar football fields in Texas. And we have much more of the lag. But we didn't build them until we had applied a soil and water conservation program to the entire state of Texas, a program of water harvest. We have 196 major dams in Texas. Texas is one fourth the size of West Australia. And on every creek and river, we have dams. We have 6,736 of them in Texas. We have as many creeks and rivers in West Australia, but we don't do a damn thing about it. We have six million acres under irrigation because those dams, that water harvest keeps our aquifers recharged. We have 13,300,000 head of cattle in Texas, a state a quarter of the size of this one. We have 128 major feedlots, finishing 5,685,000 head of cattle a year. We have the renewable resources to match Texas if we just face up to it. Of 50 billionaire millionaires that were recently named in the press, there's only one that I know of that does a damn thing about our water, our renewable resources, and he is to be applauded for a fantastic program, and that's Twiggy Forest. Meanwhile, we sit by and foreign investment capitalizes on our renewable resources. I first came to WA in 1965 for Art Linkletter and a group of Hollywood people to check their investments. Uh, I had met my first Australian Dome Guadalcanal as a 17 year old. I, I had, uh, I was going with the most beautiful girl in Texas and she said, Jack, you've got to join up and go win the war. So we're losing. So I joined up and went off to win the war. She married a damn Yankee. <laughs> And you can just imagine when West Australians call me a Yank for that crying bird bed, it kind of upsets me just a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, I was on Guadalcanal and we got a beer ration. Well, I was from Dadgers country in Texas, and we didn't drink beer. Anybody that drank beer and dance was going to hell. But I met two Australians. Sure enough, they drank beer. <laughs> I think they were Methodists. But anyway, uh, being a tall poppy from Texas, I thought I had to impress them. So I told Digger, I said, you know, Digger, we got a lot of ingenious people back in Texas. Did you know that we invented the toilet seat? He said, yeah, I knew that. I said, how the hell did you know that? He said, well, because we improved on it. <laughs> I said, how do you improve on a toilet seat? He said, we cut a hole in the center. <laughs> so anyway, that was my first uh, experience with Australia. After the war, I, uh, I, I, in fact, I had quit high school a senior year to join the service to go win the war. And uh, on May 29th this year, 70 years later, I went back to Spur, Texas, and I graduated from high school. So, you fellas have got an education, you don't have nothing on me. Uh, but after the war, I went to university. 
uh, convinced them that I was smart enough to go without a high school diploma, and I graduated with honors. I went to work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I wound up making a considerable reputation for myself, and that's the reason Mark Linkletter uh, called me, and I wound up out here. He wanted me to come out here and analyze his investment. Now this is the mighty state of Texas, and I was raised right about there. Spur is right up about here. That's where I was born, and that's where I was papers is where I was raised. And ladies, I'm not just a pretty face. When I was going to uh, Pecos High School, my date was a girl named Lois Lane. Uh, she was Superman's girlfriend in all the on TV and in, in the movies. But her real name was Gypsy Ann Stell, and Gypsy Ann and I used to be the best jitterbugs in West Texas. <laughs> and of course, you guys, and all you cowboys, think you got nothing on me. I rode Tom Mix's horse when I was five years old. <laughs> now there's a big state of West Australia. Four times the size of Texas. It little values its renewable resources, its soil and water. If this giant state were a country, it would be the world's eighth largest. Yet due to its ignorance and the influence of uh, ignorant dreamies, you put the Kimberley in the heritage. Uh, the whole re Kimberley region from the Fitzroy Basin north. You know, you could develop the renewable resources of the Kimberley leave the pristine parts out for tourism, and you could double the state's income. Now, on the way to Australia in 1965, uh, Art Linkletter asked us to go to Libya with Dr. Herbert Hammer. Dr. Hammer was trying to get a major oil concession in Libya, and he was, uh, King Innes was concerned about all his people leaving the oil patch to, for better jobs, and he wanted to stay on the oasis and cruise and food. So, Linkletter suggested to Hammer that we go with him and maybe we could come up with an ag program that would draw the people back to the oasis. So, we went to Libya with, doc, with uh, Dr. Hammer, and we took a, his corporate jet and visited every oasis in Libya. And we decided that if there was good water in Libya, it was here at the Kufra Oasis. Now, what we did is we came up with a program to drill for water right here at Kufra. And we was convinced that there was good water there from the geology we had found that Mobile Oil Company had done. And it was going to cost three quarters of a million dollars to put a rig out there. Well, we sold Dr. Hammer and King Idris on a program where Oxy would take 5% of its net after profit, and Libya would match it, and it would all go into Oasis Agriculture. Well, they moved the rig across there, and they drilled for water here at Kufra. And at 200 meters, they hit artesian water, and those, the water shot 128 feet in the air. And those bores flowed 10,000 gallons a minute. Well, later, King Idris went off to Switzerland on holidays and Gaddafi overthrew it. And he came up with the Man Made River Project. So he's from Kufra, he built a 12.3 meter pipeline that's bigger around in this room from 4,000 kilometers across the Sahara Desert to Tripoli and Benghazi up here and pipe that water. It's called the Man-Made River Project, and it cost $29 billion. But I'm real proud of the role that my partner and I played in finding that big water. Uh, hydrologists have said it's the biggest find in world history. And as a result of that, when we first found that water, we put in these mile circles of sprinkler systems on the, on the sand dunes of the Sahara, 
And here we're growing alfalfa, which is a lucerne crop. Now I came on to Australia and I met John Lewis, who used to be your director of engineering in, in Darwin. And uh, we flew the Fitzroy River. I couldn't believe it when I was flying down that river. Now here's a river that flows the same as the Rio Grande River in Texas, where we had built two dams on that river and created a $1.4 billion economy in Texas. But there wasn't a, a, a gallon of this water being used for purpose, any purpose. It was growing, flowing, and uh, taking the topsoil into the Indian Ocean, and uh, that was it. So that's where the concept started farming in my mind to come up with a major program out here. Now, at that time, I'm going to admit that I was ignorant of the animosity of labor toward foreign investment, about native title. I didn't know a thing about that. Uh, I didn't know how honorary your labor unions were. Uh, I didn't realize all the obstacles that faced me, but I was overcome with the tremendous potential of the Fitzroy Valley. Now, we, Lee Glatter had an option around the playing station, and we visited there. And this is the Talgarno Artesian Bore. This bore is flowing 755 gallons a minute. Now, it has some salinity, but we, we use water of this salinity in the southwestern United States and grow tremendous crops of cotton and grain soil. So anyway, uh, what we did is we decided, we hooked, uh, you have 56 pound pressure at the wellhead, so we hooked sprinkler systems onto that system and we grew 72 different crops that had potential. And we convinced, I convinced Conagra, the guy, big tall guy there is Jim McTeer, who was the president of Conagra, the biggest food company in the world, to join with Lee Letter, and we wanted to put in 300,000 acres of irrigation there, or 30,000 acres initially. And uh, we wanted a, a land concession to go forward with that. Well, of course, Lee Clatter owned the station and he would give up the land, but the Land Act says, and it still says, you got a Land Act that ought to be tossed in the tent, is where it ought to be, but you can only take 65 hectares from a leasehold to put into a cropping situation. Well, they offered to let Lee Clatter and Conagra do 65 hectares, and we had a tidal port in Broome, which couldn't take a ship of any size to export grain. And so they pulled out. It, it just wasn't big enough. So what I did uh, is I, we did, we did bring this, this valley system over here, and we grew this crop at, at Isle Plains in 1966. It's 4,000 pound yield, which is a respectable yield. It's nothing phenomenal. But uh, anyway, because they wouldn't give up the land possession, Conagra and Linkletter pulled out and went home. Well, I bought this sprinkler system, and I had bought a little Kilto station because I found out it had a big aquifer under it. It's just out of brew. And uh, uh, the government told me that if I moved that system on to Kilto, they would take the leasehold away from me. Well, today, uh, the West Australian owner, uh, he, spe he speaks better Australian than I do, uh, he's got nine sprinkler systems going and he furnishes most of the vegetables that you're buying down at the grocery store. Now, I had met uh, the CSRO had put out a report that there was no uh, appreciable amounts of groundwater for agriculture in the community. And I met Mary Johnston with Wapit. 
Murray was a little short guy, but he was a, he was a full bottle of water. He, he knew more about water in West Australia than any living human. And he told me, he said, Jack, there's lots of water in the Kimberley. He said, CSRO said there's none here, but there are. There's lots of artesian and subartesian water. So I asked him if he would help, you, help me document it. So what we did is we, over two years, we, we did all the seismic studies, everything we could get our hands on, and we determined that West Australia had an artesian, subartesian basin up there the size of Spain, but it had never been tapped. And this is the Fitzroy River catchment area, which uh, like I say, is the same as the Rio Grande River in Texas, where we harnessed it and created a $1.4 billion economy. Now, every year we get 80% of our rainfall uh, in the Kimberley. And 80% 80, 80 of it, all of it, with topsoil, sheep, cattle, horses, infrastructure washes into the Indian Ocean. Now, if you go to the Ore Dam, which was built in 1966, since 1966, it has flowed continually to Cambridge Gulf. And it's an eco-wonderland from the dam to the Cambridge Gulf. You go down along that river and you wouldn't believe the, the, the <coughs> tropics of the beauty. And that's what we could have on the Fitzroy River if we just get off our duff and do it. Now, I came up with a, with a concept. I wanted 100,000 head of cattle because that was the magic number. I wanted a packing plant, a laboratory to put them through. I wanted a deep sea port. I wanted, a, a, I, I negotiated an act of parliament giving us the right to develop and freehold 56,600 acres on Cambella. And I had my a derby agency, which was Shell, Goodyear, and everything for the Kimberley area. In other words, it was a totally vertically integrated project. I wanted, I wanted value added in every step of the operation. So I set forth, and I bought these seven stations to get my 100,000 head of cattle. Uh, actually, I had nine million acres under option but the government stopped me because they said if they let me buy it, that they'd get voted out of office. But I was legal all the way. But this is Kiltel here, and this is Mount Dulinga, Napier, Kimberley Downs, Liberinga, and out here is Luisa Mahina. And there's 4.3 million acres. Uh, Cameron Bell once told, uh, the press, he said, uh, they asked him what they he thought about me, and he said, well, Jack's picked the eyes out of the Kimberley. That's one of the nicest compliments I've ever had. <laughs> now, this is a, a, a dam on the Fitzroy that, that diverts water onto the farm. And under the Act of Parliament, I had to build a, a levee to protect the farm. We had to build it at our cost, to their specification, then we had to give it to them. Uh, and so we built this thing, it was 28 foot high, 10 miles long, government design. And once it withstood two floods, they were to maintain it. It cost three and three quarter million dollars. And that, that was our machinery, which we brought over on a ship. And, into the Port of Brook. Now this is the farm at full development. That's 20 starter tractors. And I had determined that uh, to uh, farm that, I, I could put that uh, 56,600 acres in in 22 days with this, with this spread of, of, of starter tractors. But we laser planted all this land, and, uh, and by the way, we did all this at our cost. We invested $62 million in the Kimberleys, 
uh, unlike the government invested 500 million, which they gave to the Chinese. Now, a big problem in the Kimberley is labor. So, Killer Nodger was a good mate of mine, the, the chief of these of the Luma tribe. So I said to him, Killer, we'll, we'll excise the acreage from the Great Range. He said it was sacred, so we said, okay, we'll, I'll, give, we'll, I'll give it to you if the government will build a village. So we had them camped under uh, cardboard boxes, sheets of tin, and everything else all over the place when we bought liver ago. So we got this, this community built. It's called Luma. It's a dry community, and it's the most successful Aboriginal community ever built in the Kimberleys to this day. There's no liquor allowed there, and uh, it's about two or three times the size now. But I had, I was the largest employer of Aboriginal in the Kimberleys. I gave them their meat ration, but I knew the makeup of their families. How many kids they had, the, the whole family, I made them take flour, tea, and sugar at my cost. Well, things were going good. And the government come up there and said, you can't do that. You've got to give them the, let them buy their own flour, tea, and sugar. And uh, we're going to give them the dole. We give them liquor. And we give them the boat. Well, the next muster season come around and the Cowboys, 98 of them said, boss, we can't saddle up. And what's the problem? The sit-down pay is too good. They could subtract what they could get under the stockman's reward from the dole, and the sit-down pay was too good. So that's when I introduced helicopter mustard and fixed wing mustard into the Kimberley. Now my, my employees, my associates came from 28 countries of birth, and most of them the Australians were from Queensland. I didn't have but three Texans up there, and I had uh, about three West Australians. The rest of them were from Queensland and, and from Europe. Now we had Brahman and Shorthorn cattle. We, we, we were crossing Brahmins on, on the Shorthorn to get, uh, get that good, a good vigor in, in our cattle. And, uh, we had about two and a half million acres like this of Flinders and Mitchell grass, beautiful range country, uh, hellacious grass fire country. But uh, West Australia has about a million two cattle, I believe is the number today. Uh, Texas has got 13,300,000 in, in one fourth the area that you've got. This was our first crop in 1970, and Premier Brand was going on a tour up there. And uh, so I knew he was a farmer, so I parked my combine in this good grain sort of crop. And sure enough, he got up there and he said, boy, could I make a round on that combine? I said, yes, sir. Well, he got on there and he went around and he got back and he said, they said, Premier, you gotta go. You, you know, you got an itinerary. He said, no, I'm gonna make another round. So he went around again. And uh, so the Ag Department had, they had 10 state houses there and I was wanting two of them for my farmers. But they wouldn't give me any of them. And so anyway, the, they had an experimental block there. And uh, so, he said, I want to see what the Ag Department's doing here. And they said, well, Premier, you don't have time. You take too much time here. He said, no, I'm going to take time. I'm going to see. So we went over to look at the Ag Blocks. Well, in all fairness, they had recycled a sort of, in other words, they had harvested an original crop and then slashed it, and they had the regrowth. And the regrowth wasn't, the little heads weren't half as big as these. And Two, the boy that was taking care of the crop had gone off on holidays halfway through the crop and had to irrigate it when he should have. So it was pretty, it was, it was really sad. And the premier looked at that and he said, well, you know, I think we can learn from Alco. 
So I'm pulling the ag department out of come out. Well, I was glad to get the houses, but boy, it made a mortal enemy out of the ag department. <laughs> Now, in 1970, I built a few yards, and uh, everybody said, you bloody yaks, what are you going to think up next? <laughs> Those cattle aren't going to stay in that yard, they're going to lay down and die. They won't eat in there. Well, here I had 10,240 head on, on feed, and of course we own the little uh, control of the Derby Abattoir when we package our meat, and then later we acquired brew. But uh, uh, today, then it was a zero dollar exporter for Australia. And I was the laughing stock of the killer. Today it's a two and a half billion dollar export market for Australia. But Texas has 128 of these feedlots. And we could be furnishing a lot of the beef to Japan and to China and those countries, and we were lagging far behind, I tell you. I counted for 30% of all the road train traffic in the Kimberley. And uh, at, at, at this stage, we were, we were exporting 37% of all the cattle in the Kimberley from our stations and through our packing plan. We were putting one of every three dollars in circulation. And uh, now somewhere, uh, Bill Muir, he used to have, he passed away, but had Muir books, he used to call me every time he'd get an article on the Kimberley. There was an engineer back in the 50s that said if somebody would drill at Campbellum, they find big water at 1,450 feet. Well, I thought somebody ought to give him a go. So we went down and drilled this bore. And we hit this water at 1,450 feet. And this bore on the farm is producing uh, 2,000 gallons a minute. Now, the reason we went to bores is because one day I was in my office and Lane Hancock called. And I, I office was laying, and I went down, and he said, did you read the paper this morning? I said, no. He said, the Shaw is going to spend $100 million in three countries for food security. He said, your program is what he needs to be in. You should be in Tehran. Well, I got on the plane, went to Tehran the next day. I figured the Shaw would probably put his pants on just like I did, one leg at a time. So I went over there. And I got in to see the Minister of Agriculture, and he said, I can give you five minutes. Well, I started telling him the Alco story, and two hours later, he called a guy in, and he said, I want uh, all the top people in the Ag Department there for a conference. So we went in, and we had about 30. And I have I had a, two films with me, Alco Down Under, a marketing film, which had won the Perth Film Festival in 1970, and another one that uh, Big Country had done called How High Is Up. Well, anyway, at 4 o'clock that afternoon, I walked out of there with a $40 million commodity contract. So, anyway, I came home, and then I was walking on air. Well, I had to go to Canberra and, and get the approval of Whitlam. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we had a labor government that was behind me, John Tonkin, and Herb Graham went with me. Well, we went over there, and we, John Oberry and, and Herb and I went over, and, and we met with Whitlam and Crean, and uh, uh, we went in, and I offered to shake hands with Mr. Crean, who was, walked out to meet us. And he wouldn't shake hands, he just told us to sit down. So we sat down and he said, now young man, he said, we admire what you've done in the Caribbean. But we don't like it because Australians haven't done it. Now we've got enough of your kind in this country and we don't need any more. Now what can we do for you? <laughs> well, being, being smarter than the average, I figured I'd fly like a snake, you know. So anyway, uh, we 
we made our presentation of, of the good it could do for the state and the nation, and, and uh, we went out. And that night I met with Mr. Mahoney at the Southern Cross Hotel. And he said, Jack, he said, I'm sorry, but Mr. Whitman told me that he did not want me giving strength to foreign investment as represented by your company. So he killed the deal. And of course, if that dam had still been there, we'd still be there. Now that's what 100 square miles of grain sorghum looks like. I had brought uh, eight of these sprinkler systems. Those are quarter mile arms. They go down a ditch. There's eight of these, and they just walk across that country irrigated. And the rest of it was gravity irrigated. But, but there was 100 square miles of sorghum. This crop, this crop was worth about $18 million today is what it would be worth. Well, about that time, we had a flood on the Fitzroy, and it drowned 60,000 head of cattle on the watershed, starting up at uh, Fossil and uh, Jubilee, right on down to Luberinga, and it washed away that, that farm, which we spent $28 million on, that levee went, uh, the whole thing went. Well, uh, I should have been depressed, but I wasn't, because I had a bank in London sold on coming in and picking up the pieces and going ahead with us. And uh, so I poured a scotch and walked out on the veranda and I was thinking about how lucky I was that I sold this bank. And Brian Burke and his bandits come riding over the mountain. <laughs> well, they, uh, my bankers, was telexing them and telling them they wanted them to meet with me that they were going to bail us out, we are going to keep going, and they would never give me an apartment. I never was privy to talking to the grill. Uh, I did have a delegation of John Lewis and, and Terry Woodrow and a whole bunch of them went to uh, Burke and told him that, damn it, that he should stay with us, that we we, you know, we had a $2 million payroll in the Kimberley. We were putting one of every three dollars in circulation up there. But he, he no, he said, I want the Yanks out of the Kimberley. So anyway, that was it. So I, I tell these people worried about these Chinese, I said, well, maybe they'll have better luck. None of them have a Texas accent. <laughs> One of the things we did get done, we got a grain shed. Roy Held and I uh, worked together to get this built at the Port of Broome. The gun, our, our company was to repay for it over 50, uh, 15 years. Uh, but of course, when Burke shot us out of the saddle, uh, we, we never did pay for it. But one thing that I did get done, and you won't, if you ever go to Broome, you'll see a tourist ship in there. Now Broome was a tidal port. It used to be, if you couldn't sit on the bottom, you couldn't use Broome. And it limited us to our shipping. Well, this meant that any ship could go into Broome now. And uh, so, like I say, you, you, you'll probably see some politician's name on the flag, but it ought to be me and my partner. But that, that that development has meant has been a godsend to the business community of Broome and that area. And Broome, as you know, is a big tourism town. And uh, now this was the Fitzroy last year. That's Liberiga Station, and that's Halls Creek. And yet the government says the labor government that we have today says there's not enough water up there to support a viable agriculture. You know, I, I, I get so goddamn mad every time I read about this food bowl crap and that we don't have the resources and we don't have the water. Uh, I don't know where those people come from. Uh, I just don't know. And, and they just don't have any damn sense. And that's what I, that's what I say. When the money boom is over, what do we do now? We've hollered it out. We've, We've sent it to China, 
And uh, I thought, Brian, I thought we had a China food bowl over here. But, oh, it happened good. Anyway, I've got a book that uh, tells a sad story of all this. It, it documents all your dam sites in the Kimberleys, all your resources up there. What a fantastic place it could be. And it comes with a DVD for 40 bucks, and I've got a few of them here, anybody that's interested. And I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. For market. Marketing is the name of the game. Another reason because it's subtropical. The ord is more tropical. And you have a lot more insect problems at the ord than you do at Camp Island. And we raise cotton there every year for years. We never had to spray it. So, no, because of our isolation and because of our good culture of practices, uh, we never did have a real. Actually, I worked on the scheme with uh, you and uh, the first irrigation scheme in the Carter Pitman system. Um, I worked with uh, John Lewis and a couple of people who were in the country. Um, I just wondered what happened to Charlie Hudson and where did Ryan Bill and the two guys that really were really the backbone of the people on the side of it? Charlie's back in New Mexico and uh, he's had real bad heart trouble. Yeah. West Rodney's 92 and he just made me a pair of spurs. And uh, uh, he, but he's not going to get me on horse. Uh, <laughs> he's back in Hale Center, Texas. And in fact, recently I set up a tour for our Rio Tinto group uh, to go over there and see irrigation around Lubbock, Texas, where you'd see more sprinkler irrigation anywhere in the world. And Wes uh, played host to him and had a Mexican dinner for him. And, but he's doing great. He's 92 now. Great guy. Yeah, but Jack, you had a check you used to have on the wall. Yes, sir, I've, I've got a check. It was, uh, uh, I started to bring that today, uh, and I forgot it. I, it's, I got a check for a cow one time for six cents. And Bill Bailey called me from the West Australia, and he said, uh, hey, Jack, he said, uh, uh, I was going to call you about the political situation. What do you think is going to happen if Whitlam gets reelected? Well, I always call Whitlam President Whitlam because he always wanted a republic. And uh, so I said, well, Bill, if President Whitlam gets reelected, I said, today I got a check for six cents for a cow. <laughs> and I think if he gets reelected, cattle prices are double with 12 cents a cow. <laughs> yeah, so I'd like to make a comment about this because uh, Jack's aware who I am and where I've been. And uh, we've been on uh, delivering at Cambellan for quite a number of years, seeing what goes on there and uh, what happened to your levy bank. But the thing that Blackwell niggles me is you've got 60,000 acres laser level with the infrastructure there or the remains of it and woody woody weeds are taking all this over. Compare that with uh, Kim Durack's energy in starting the ore development and then switching on to Fitzroy. It's amazing the comparison between the ore now and what Fitzroy is at the moment. And that's something that niggles me tremendously. Particularly, as you know, we've got a sun up in the Kimberley there at the moment that's fighting with um, mining interests coming in there and taking over pastoral land or making it very difficult. At the same time, 
I'd suggest that concrete, steel, and asphalt roads, and stuff like that are not very nutritious, particularly in the world that is overpopulated. What will happen in the next few decades, I don't know, but there's a, a potential there in that West Kimberley area for a hell of a lot more that hasn't been done. Amen. Thank you, Roger, and thank you for the opportunity to express on behalf of us all our appreciation for this background information uh, from a true giant in the agricultural world of the pastoral industry and its conversion to an agricultural history which is created very much as a team endeavour and over the many, many years of our association he's a person whenever I feel a bit down in the mouth I get out there and have a few words with Jack and there'll be an experience that comes out of it that um, gives me a good reason to keep on going into the next days. So Charles Court's name wasn't mentioned today and I know that this is um, just a small slip that's come through from Jack's side because on the many occasions we've discussed the pastoral scene and the Kimberleys in particular, he's always made that point that he had this benefit of Sir David Brand and then Sir Charles Court as being the people that backed him all the way from a Western Australian point of view and unfortunately had that opposition from a federal point of view that didn't allow things to happen. But I know that um, we today and in this room there is a great cross-section of our great state, particularly our northern state, and there are memories I know that would go back to families, fathers, uncles, and those that were directly and indirectly related to the happenings of this hard and testing area of our state. And to see things happening today, quite different to what was happening in the period of, say, 50 or 60 years ago, is at least, Jack, something I feel that you can take some course of acknowledgement for, because it was your single effort and enthusiasm that brought to this country um, a renewal of our pioneering spirit that's made Western Australia what it is. And we today collectively say to you, well done, you are a champion, and we take a great benefit out of the knowledge of that which you've done. And so on behalf of us all today, may I ask your normal way of expressing yourself in thanking Jack Fletcher, a giant and an icon in our industry, for providing us with information of one of the segments of Western Australia.